I'm Camille Weber. We are here with Myron Redford, and today's date is May 16, 2016. So my first question for you, Myron, is why wine? Uh, do you want the short or the long version? Oh man, I want the long version. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might be here a few hours. Um, I uh, was spending uh, um, a year in Turkey uh, at Middle East Technical University. Um, I was going to Antioch College and they had a study abroad program and I had lived in Turkey from 1958 to 1960 with my family and then uh, developed some good friendships uh, and <coughs> used the excuse of the uh, year abroad to come back to Turkey. And at the end of uh, that year, my good friend, uh, two good friends, um, flew in uh, George Gutman from Paris and Paul Silverman from Rome and they joined me in Ankara and we started our hitchhiking trip and we were going to hitchhike from Ankara up to the Black Sea coast, along the Black Sea coast, through the Russian border, all around the Black Sea coast and come, you know, back out through Romania and Bulgaria and come into Istanbul that way. So we're, anyway, uh, to, there was no way we could get across the border into Russia, first of all. The, <laughs> the Russians had minefields on one side, the Turks had minefields on the other. The Turkish army wouldn't let you within 10 miles. So anyway, we had to abort our planned uh, perusal of that and so we came down and our friend Paul was a linguist and he decided to stay in Istanbul and George and I hitchhiked for three months from Istanbul to London, England to meet his future wife and a, a girlfriend of mine. On this trip I, I was recovering from an ulcer and so I had been on a the ulcer diets and I, you know, milk and I wasn't allowed any alcohol, of course. So we're hitchhiking along in Bulgaria and we get stuck in this little town and um, it's at night and this guy is trying to help us get through the town because, and anyway, we go outside of town and we're out in the forest and we think he's going to roll us, but he takes us up and up and up and we come out and we're in a tourist camp because it was a communist country and back then you know if you were tourists driving around you had to stay in designated places anyway to make a to try and cut to the chase he was so happy that 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 he we realized that he was he was trying to help us not uh, rob us that he um, insisted we have some Bulgarian white wine and uh, I said, you know, I pointed to my stomach and no, no, there was no, no. So I had some and it tasted pretty good and I didn't get a reaction. And the rest of our trip through Romania, uh, Yugoslavia, um, Austria, Germany, every place we went, we were trying wines and so forth. And I sort of got the wine bug. And uh, I always like to tell the story about on the Mosul um, when we were hitchhiking and you'd come to a, a, a ghost house and people would be renting rooms, but they also were often a small winery. And so you'd go in for dinner and they would serve you the house wine in a pitcher. And the first place we stayed at in the Mosul, they served this wine, and it was just incredible, just wonderful. And I learned how to say in German, please, I would like to have the house wine. So we go up 
only about maybe 15 miles up the Mosul, we find another place, we sit down for dinner, it's a nice dinner, and they bring the wine, and I, I mean, I, I do my little thing, and then they bring the wine, and it's horrible. <laughs> it's just horrible. And this light went off in my head, and I said, George, you know, just in that short a distance, the same grapes, wine can be so different. And that was the start of my uh, thing. So when I came back to the United States, I um, started trying all different kinds of wines. Um, and in Ohio, in 1968, um, there were, Catawba was, uh, the local grape that was being done, and but I just I just was fascinated with all of it, and and uh, then my uh, uh, my whole college career was planning to go into the diplomatic corps, mm -hmm. and I uh, uh, passed everything, but I failed the physical, and um, so I. What am I going to do with the rest of my life now that I'm not going to be a diplomat? Mm -hmm. And so I went back home to Seattle and uh, um, after a year as a bartender, I got a job at the University of Washington and I started trips down to California visiting small wineries and uh, that became what I, what I did anywhere there was wine. And uh, so, I don't know, about a, after a, a year I was having lunch with my mother who was the uh, head of the reference library and uh, we were in the faculty club and this group of guys at the next table were talking about making premium vinifera wine in Washington State. Well, Washington State wines before 69 when the voters put in an initiative to allow California wines in the grocery stores was terrible. I mean, it was god awful. Um, it was wine o wine. And uh, so I said, oh, come on, you guys. Nobody, nobody makes vinifera wine in Washington. It's all garbage. And mm -hmm. they said, oh, well, young man, you just don't know the history of the state. And, he says, we have associated vintners and uh, we, we've been making wine since 1960 and it's all vinifera. And I said, wow. And they invited me out to the winery to visit them. And uh, I was already pretty hooked on drinking wine and visiting wineries and exploring and finding out the nuances and uh, so I went out the first day at lunch. Uh, I'm sitting there with the winemaker who was the head of the call, uh, he was the Dean of College of Arts and Sciences. The chemist was the head of the chemistry department at the University of Washington. The lawyer was the head of the law school <laughs> at the University of Washington. And the vice president for fisheries had just come back from Russia and he had a loaf of black peasant bread about this big and a gallon of caviar. Oh, and, you know, so we're all sitting here eating caviar and Russian bread and drinking all these wines and I'm here with all these famous people and going, whoa. And I said, well, do you guys ever need any help? Because they, they only um, met on weekends, basically, when they were all off their jobs. And they said, sure. So that was the start of my entry from going from a wine consumer to a wine producer. And after a couple of years um, of doing this part time, uh, I got hooked, I joined a local winemaking group, I started buying wine tanks and stuff, and I was gonna put a winery in Port Townsend, Washington, where I, I, I had a farm, because I figured that it was gonna become a tourist mecca, and I was right. Um, 
but I had, during the course of all this coming and going and stuff, I had got a chance to taste uh, Burgundy, um, and my brother was a, a lawyer in San Francisco, and uh, you know we tried it, and then the, anyway, I got hooked on Burgundy and Pinot Noir, and so the. Uh, I heard, I had heard that there was, uh, people were starting to make wine in Oregon and Pinot Noir. And I remember I th the first Oregon wines I tried were from Hillcrest. And I think the first trip there, the winery was closed, so I just went to the grocery store and bought a bottle of Pinot. The, se <laughs> the second trip I'll never, the first time I visited the winery, I'll never forget it. It was the middle of summer. It was hot. It must have been 80, 90 degrees. And I come up and Richard Summers had this little tin shed that um, was his tasting room. And all around on tables on the sides of this were open bottles of wine. Uh, the, as I say, the temperature inside was probably between 90 and 100, and there's all these open bottles of wine. And Richard says, he gives me a glass, says, here, just go ahead and taste around, see what you like. And he was busy because his work crew came in, and the, part of their pay was in wine, and he, at that time, just opened a, a valve on one of his barrels and and was filling up jugs <laughs> and each woman or man was bringing a half gallon or a gallon and it was filling it up with uh, Dago Red. And did I, I, don't, I don't know whether I ever brought you guys that label, but I, I, um, Hillcrest, the guy that bought Hillcrest finally found a copy of it and uh, I'll, I'll have to get it get it to you because everybody goes, oh, come on, the government would never put a label on a wine Dago Red. I said, yes. <laughs> anyway, he, he changed it to Mellow Red. But uh, so um, that, that was quite an experience, but actually one of the best Pinot Noirs I, I ever had was a 1970 from Hillcrest. Um, and um, so it, Richard, Richard rather than David Lett, is the actual father of Pinot Noir in Oregon. He made the first Pinot Noir. He planted the first Pinot Noir. But because he was in Roseburg and quite eccentric, as you can see, I mean, Richard used to, I mean, I used to run into people from Roseburg, and when they'd come up to my tasting room and they'd say, uh, and then we'd get talking and they'd say, oh yeah, well, we're from Roseburg and when we were on the high school football team, we used to go up at night, wake Richard up and <laughs> drag him over to the winery and get, fill up our, our jugs of uh, oh. mellow, mellow red <laughs> and, and go off in the night, you know, and so we're, I mean, this poor man tried to start a winery in the middle of, of uh, a timber town culture with no, <laughs> and he had to do what he did to, to, to survive. But anyway, so that's, that's sort of the evolution. Then my mother had a friend uh, and, and I was over there and he said, oh, I hear you're interested in Pinot Noir. He says, here, you gotta see this guy, Jerry Preston. He lives in Oregon and he's starting a winery. So I said, okay. Um, and uh, I went and visited him, I don't know, 71, I think it was. Yeah, that was 71. And uh, so that was my first visit to Amity and the Mobile Chateau, which is, has died a noble death this past week. And uh, so that's how I got uh, started in, in, at Amity. Uh, I can go through all the details, but basically I ended up buying Amity Vineyards from Jerry and Ann because they got a divorce and mm -hmm. in 73, um, and uh, in 
74, um, I, I purchased the place uh, because my prohibition era mother uh, got me, a, a offered to mortgage her house because although I own 1,300 feet of waterfront up in Port Townsend, and several acres that was extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. When I went to the banks in Port Townsend, they'd say, oh yes, we'll loan you, that's very valuable property. What do you want to use the money for? I want to buy a vineyard in Oregon. Oh, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't finance projects out of state. So then I went to the banks in Seattle and they'd say, Oh yeah, sure. We'd we'd loan for a, buying a vineyard in Oregon. What what's your collateral? Well, I have this land up in Port Townsend. I'm sorry, we don't use land outside of King County. <laughs> oh, man. Banking has changed. So my mother just blew me away. I didn't ask her to because she was uh, uh, she was a prohibition person. She never even owned a credit card until later in her life. So, but that's how it all started. Wow. Well, you mentioned uh, David Lett and Richard Sumner, but usually when we hear about um, who is the real Papa Pino, it's either David Lett or Charles Corey. So it's really interesting that he isn't a part of that conversation. Or you well, know. you got to understand that you know the mm -hmm. victors of any war write the history. Right. Okay. And there was, when I came in, a tension between Roseburg and the Umpqua Valley and, and South and the Willamette Valley. Um, before I arrived, uh, there had been in a uh, Curry and Latin Ponzi and so forth, had joined the Oregon Wine Growers Association, which was started, I think, by Paul B. Elland in uh, Roseburg. And, you know, they went to a couple meetings and quickly figured out that what that group wanted to do is have parties and drink wine. Okay, what the northern group wanted to do was to have meetings and learn how to make better wine and grow better grapes. So there was a split in the industry. They formed a uh, Northern Oregon or Northern Willamette Valley Wine Association or something like that. And so we had one group in the South and so forth. So as the Willamette Valley kept growing and growing and growing, um, and it's still true today, you know, if you go talk to somebody in New York City and say, Oregon, they say Pinot Noir. And you say, Pinot Noir, they say, well, I'm at Valley, Pinot Noir. Nobody talks about um, uh, the Umpqua Valley. And Richard was not a self-promoter like David was, or Charles. Um, but the historical fact is the first Pinot was planted by Summers. The first Pinot was made by Summers. Papa Pinot is Papa Willamette Pinot. Mm. Um, and uh, the controversy as to Let or Curry will go on for ever and ever depending upon who you talk to. But um, you know, David was a pioneer. He was the first one to plant it here. Um, Corey was about a megasecond behind him. And some people you talk to in the industry say that it was a, basically Corey's idea and, and Let was just faster. And other people say other things. But they started the industry in the north. But uh, you know, it's uh, it's the story, and David Lett and Papa Pino just keeps getting repeated and repeated and repeated. And mm -hmm. the first person to be sort of wiped out was Charles Curry. I mean, uh, I think when I came here and talked to you guys, nobody 
that I talked to knew who the hell Charles Curry was because he crashed and burned, but he was a, a brilliant and major contributor to the beginning of this industry. Uh, he, he taught classes on viticulture um, and everybody in the industry came to them, you know, and um, he, he did that. David uh, wasn't as, um, didn't have that much an impact in terms of interacting and so forth with, like Curry did in terms of teaching classes and so forth. Um, his, his impact was, uh, you know, being the f first Pinot in the Valley and, and, uh, and then the, his 75 South Block getting that tasting against that, that put, that was the first of several events that put on the, put Oregon on the map. Well, are there any other unsung heroes like Corey? Excuse me? Are there any other unsung heroes such as Corey or is he, might, well, is he one of the major Well, I don't ones? know. Um, uh, the, the wineries and the wine makers and owners, of course, get most of the attention because not too many consumers say, oh, let's go tour a vineyard. Let's go out and prune grapes in February in the, in the rain and so forth. Um, like Gary Fuqua, you know, probably not a name that pops up, but Gary was the chairman of the Viticultural Committee for, I don't know, 10 years at least. And I was a member of the Viticulture Committee also. And Gary played a, you know, an important um, role. Um, somebody I remember. Um, David Adelsheim is, is uh, well known, but um, David was the sort of the organization person. He had a sense of helping, you know, when the industry would be in crises and so forth to come in and sort of develop a ways. Um, and he also had contacts. That's why David Lett got his wine in the French tasting. It's because uh, uh, um, David Adelsheim, uh, well, that may not be true. David Lett may have known, uh, um, I, I can't think of her name right now, but she was uh, Beth, Becky Wasserman, mm -hmm. who was an importer of, of Burgundies back then. Anyway, but David Adelsheim was the one that focused on bringing in French cultivars mm -hmm. and the Dijon clones are the one everybody talks about now but he also earlier brought in uh, Gamay and some Gewurztraminer and Pinot Blanc about I th my memory is about eight to ten years earlier than the Dijon clones um, and he, he uh, uh, also played an important part in, um, well, I, I can't remember the first. Um, I'm not, I, I, I'll have to back up. I'm not sure that he played in a, a critical role in the uh, truce uh, between the, the, we reformed the Oregon Wine Growers Association and uh, we took the name that the Southern group had and uh, the two organizations came together. Um, 
I don't exactly remember the date, but that was the first, that was an important um, part. <coughs> and uh, uh, um, Valley View Vineyards, Frank Wisniewski. Frank tragically died. He was a contractor and he was diving in, in, near a dam or something, went down to check something on a project and they never found him. Uh, but if Frank had, had lived, uh, I think things would have been a little different. He, but he was, he was the founding uh, person for uh, the Rogue Valley and, and planting uh, grapes down there. Um, and uh, then his, his sons played a, a major uh, role in, in the South. Um, Bill Fuller, I'm sure you know, know mm -hmm. him. Bill was the outlier in the industry because the thing that that drove Ponzi, Lett, the Campbells, me, the Sokol Blosser, Adelsheim. I'm sure I'm missing somebody. We were all totally passionate about Pinot Noir and total ignoramuses about making any money in the business or focusing on making money in the business. I, you know, that, that was, I don't know when we had our first business meeting at the OWA. I mean, we were focused on growing the best grapes, making the best wine, and having fun doing it. Well, Bill Fuller, had been a winemaker at several places in California before he went into partnership with this uh, and started two Alton Vineyards. Mm -hmm. And his partner was a banker and they were there to make money. They weren't there to spoof around and worry, you know. And so one of the first things that, that, that Bill did that en enamored him to the uh, ideologic, uh, the ideological section of the industry is that we uh, um, had, I don't think we had instituted our labeling laws yet, so we were still working under the federal laws. And at that time, the federal laws did not require an appellation of origin on the label. So you could just put Pinot Noir in the name of your winery. Well, when Bill came up, there weren't many grapes in Oregon, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so he went up to Washington, and I think it was a Riesling. You have to ask Bill. Uh, he'll have a different take on the story. Mm -hmm. um, but. So went up and bought grapes up in Washington, made a Riesling, and here was this Tualatin Vineyards, Riesling, Forest Grove, Oregon. And we went ballistic because, of course, any consumer picking the bottle up would go, oh, Forest Grove, Oregon? Oh yeah, this is an Oregon Riesling. There was nothing on the bottle that said that it was made from Washington grapes. and that was one of the things that pushed us toward the labeling regulations. Mm -hmm. Dave Adelsheim was very important in that uh, aspect and David Lett too. Uh, because uh, one of our first things was that we required all Oregon wines had to have an appellation of origin on them. And uh, so you, you could distinguish it. Big mistake we made the big mistake we made was that we didn't prohibit the use of Oregon geographical names as brands. 
So now we have Willamette Valley Vineyards, for example, mm -hmm. is the, the most egregious. Uh, they did nothing wrong. It was perfectly legal. It was just our industry should not have allowed that to happen because I don't know how many times people came up to my winery and they'd pick up one of my wines which said Willamette Valley on it mm -hmm. and they'd say, oh, are, are you part of Willamette Valley Vineyards? <laughs> okay, anyway, where, where were we? Um, unsung heroes. Uh, at the moment, that's... That's quite uh, a list. Oh, uh, it's, well, you know about Scott Henry. Mm. Scott Henry was the, the balancing normal wine person to Richard Summers, the crazy guy down in the valley. Uh, he was an, an, an engineer. Uh, Erath was an engineer. Ponzi was an engineer. Ron Volstek was an engineer. All these guys, and they all seem to know each other. Anyway, uh, he started uh, his winery and uh, was a major player in trying to make the Umpqua Valley and uh, recognized as a place for quality, quality wine. And he also played a, a large role in the early days of the, um, before we had the Oregon Wine Board, we had the Oregon Wine Advisory Board, and before that it was called the Table Wine Research council or something like that and they were I was active in most of those too but uh, uh, yeah Scott Henry and let's see I'll probably probably think of uh, some others but that's a uh, moment. No that's plenty so how do you fit into you know, that mix of people? How did those kinds of interpersonal well, dynamics work out? We are sometimes called the second generation, but we're so far back now. <laughs> they don't think, you know, um, uh, you, you have to give credit where credit's due, I mean, mm -hmm. David Lett and Charles Curry came to an area where there was no wine being made and planted grapes and, and, and started and they were followed, you know, by Ponzi E. Rath, I can't remember which one was, uh, was first there, but very close. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then uh, the, the Campbells, were were after me in terms of they were in terms of starting their winery. Sokol Blosser was after me in terms of starting their winery, but they planted grapes, I think. And Jerry Preston was part of that early group. He and Dave Lett became very good friends. Mm -hmm. And Jerry was originally going to make wine with David in the winery in McMinnville. And so you know, Jerry planted in 70, 71, um, David planted in 65, 66, so, mm -hmm. um, and I came in 74, so um, there's, that's, you know, uh, I was, um, I was very active in the Viticulture Committee, I was, uh, On the research advisory board, I wasn't very much in, involved because I wasn't a research. Uh, in a, the Ted Castile has to be uh, from the viticulture side, and uh, he has been a rock. He has just been a rock in 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 that in that area. <clears throat> Ted Gerber, 
in has a forest winery um, and he was uh, started making premium wine in the Illinois Valley. Mm -hmm. um, Ted wasn't as organizationally active, just remembering other people. Um, I tended uh, to work in uh, with the Viticulture Committee and then once we got marketing going, mm -hmm. I was very, very active in the marketing side. I was one of the first members of the Oregon uh, Wine Advisory Board. Uh, I can't remember how many terms I, I served. Right. Um, That's quite a switch from viticulture to marketing. Was that difficult for you? No. No. Um, uh, I, I guess it just sort of goes with the growth of the industry. Right. You know, in those early years, we didn't have any wine to sell. Selling wine wasn't a problem. Supply was the problem, you know? Mm -hmm. Trying to, I mean, we used to have, uh, we, we had, we, the o Oregon Wine Gores, the or North Willamette, whatever we were called, met in the Tualatin Fire Station. And then we'd go across the street, Gaffer's Pub, I can't remember what it's called. We were, let's see, I came in 74. I think it was, it, it was almost 10 years before we served Oregon wine at our meetings, <laughs> okay? Because between 74 and 84, there was, the production was so small and uh, that, you know, but then uh, somewhere, you know, in the early 80s and so forth, you know, people began to say, well, well, let's see, we've, we're making pretty good wine here and uh, we're doing some good things in the vineyard, but uh, you know, these Oregonians really don't know what the hell Pinot Noir is, and they seem to like to drink Riesling. And then when we left the um, Northwest and went outside with Riesling, everybody looked at us like we had two heads. You guys are still drinking Riesling up there in the woods? <laughs> Um, so it became evident that we needed to focus on selling, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm a pretty good promoter and gabber and stuff, and uh, I got involved in uh, in that. Um, I was uh, oh Steve Carey. Got to remember people. Steve Carey um, worked for Henny Hinsdale, was the first distributor that sort of embraced Oregon wines. And he then left and uh, when did he start Carey Oregon wines? Um, must have been in, let's see, we were selling, we sold the 83s. Sometime you could ask Steve the exact date, early 80s, um, because he, he sold the, I know he sold the 83 and the 84 and the 85 and the 86, and I think 87 and then maybe 88, uh, or he may have not even made it to 88. But he formed this group called Cary Oregon Wines, and he, went out with about 17 wineries. Um, in the beginning, he just went himself and he buy Oregon wine, carry Oregon wine, and so forth. And, was, and the industry was split. Adelsheim uh, and Lett uh, particularly were extremely um, 
Francophiles. Uh, all of us were Francophile leaning. But um, they didn't feel comfortable in competing with Burgundy because Burgundy, Burgundians were their friends, their colleagues, they were our um, uh, mentors. Well, Steve and I both experienced the same thing. Go to San Francisco, walk in, say hi, you know, you'd present your wine, they'd taste it. Oh, this is a decent four or five dollar bottle of, 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 of wine. Um, and uh, I'd say, well, I, th I, I think you're, I think you're wrong. I think this is as, as good as some of the burgundies you're carrying in your shop. Oh, no way, you're, I'd say, okay, I'll buy, you, you pick a burgundy that's twice as expensive as what I think I was wanting $10 or something like that, retail. This is not what I'm getting, it's just, and so he would, grab a $20 burgundy, and this was a long time ago when a $20 burgundy, you could buy a Premier Cru, right? Mm -hmm. So he would buy it, I'd pay him for it, and we'd open it, pour mine, and we'd just put them together, and I'd say, well, let's just taste them, okay? And we'd taste them. And I did this over and over and over again at different shops and different places, and what I found is that sometimes they would pour the burgundy, they pour mine, and they'd say, "Oh my God, your, your yours is is a better wine. I, I like yours better, and it's half the price." Most of the time, they would say, "Oh, that's interesting. They have some similarities <laughs> there," and I would say. Yeah, I don't care whether the burgundy is, whether you like the burgundy better or me, but at least by tasting them both together, you see that we're both in the same ballpark, mm -hmm. you know. And so Steve was having the same problem all over the country. And he and I came up with this idea of doing a Oregon Burgundy Challenge, and this was the Burgundy Challenge, and we used the 83 vintage because the French were, as is their way, hyping the hell out of the vintage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't think it was one of the great Burgundian vintages, but you gotta remember in Burgundy or well, in any wine region, what's your best wine? The one I have for sale is the best wine. This is the best vintage. This is great. Um, but the Burgundians are really the top. You know, they can take a shitty vintage and promote the hell out of it. And some of the um, people in the industry who knew the 83 vintage sort of felt that it wasn't as good as the French said it was, but that's beside the point. So the, um, we just, Steve was in New York and he went to the International Wine Center, which uh, was a, a retail place, but was more involved in other things, sort of marketing. And he said, would, would you guys, set up a tasting, you invite the top Burgundian restaurants, retailers, importers, wine writers, the whole bit, and you guys select the Burgundies. We won't have anything to do with it. We'll select the Oregon Pinots mm -hmm. and we'll have this tasting. And I still remember 
Steve saying, is, you know, we're sitting around waiting for the tasting to begin. I wasn't, I didn't go. Um, and Steve said, you know, you'd see two guys talking to each other. So this is going to be like shooting fish in a barrel. He says, I can tell a, a bone from a nui any day on, you know, and I can tell a premier crew from a grand. And I mean, why are they even doing this? We'll, we'll, we'll just get to drink some good burgundy and so we'll come to this tasting. I mean, they were just so full of themselves. Okay, so the tasting goes on, the results. They were supposed to do two things. One, say where the wine, you know, where, where the wine was from. Mm -hmm. And two, give their first, second, and third preferences. None of them, none of the people tasting got 50% of the origin correct. In other words, you would have done as well by flipping a coin. The top one, two, three, four, and the fifth was a tie. Wines were all Oregon wines. And it just, the impact, I mean, David's win in Burgundy in the earlier years had an impact. It had a lot of impact on Irie and his future, but it didn't have as much impact on the industry as this thing did, because here we were in the epicenter of Burgundian marketing, New York City. The royalty had just been shown to not be wearing any clothes, and the little boy on the street had to say, Mom, they don't have any clothes. Uh, and that just created a revolution across the country. We, uh, Steve uh, and we took that road show and did it, I think in Denver and in some place in California and the same effect. And I remember uh, Bill Blosser saying, Within three months after that tasting, he'd sold several years of Pinot Noir. We used to joke that Dick Erath marketed his wines by building new warehouses. Uh, the sucking sound. I mean, it just, whew. unfortunately, the downside of the whole thing was that um, we had the um, 83 Pinots, once they got all this press, the wineries jacked the prices up. Mm -hmm. But the growers had been paid crappy prices. And then 84 was a washout, so there was no price thing. Um, and in 85, there was still uh, it was still a um, buyer's market because 85 was a small, incredible vintage, much better than 83. But again, the 85s went out and the growers were not paid much. So mm -hmm. finally in 86, things changed because there would have been this, you know, so everybody wants grapes. The growers say, come to mama. <laughs> and so they, the, they wanted the prices for the 86 grapes that they should have been paid for the 85s. So mm -hmm. the Oregon Pinot was just marching out and the 86 vintage hit the market and it was a so-so vintage. But compare after the 85s and so, and so the retailers, you know, everything came out. Everybody bought the 86s because it was the next vintage and we're, we're, we're on a roll and the consumers and everybody went, whoa, 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 I'm not paying $30 a bottle for this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the 87 vintage was not a, a memorable one. And uh, it took a while before the quality and price 
thing got adjusted and it really hurt Oregon. It took us until about 94, the 94 vintage before the, the market forgave us. What do you think um, affected the quality of those grapes in 87 and 88, 89? Oh, 86 and 87, the yeah. weather. The weather? Yeah. Uh, was it just a warmer season or was it just a lot of no, rain? No, it was the, it, rain. I mean, recently we don't notice it, but rain was always a bugaboo. Mm -hmm. And we had rain during 86. And 87, as I told you, I, I, I need to go back and look at my, my books. I always thought of 87 as a... Uh, um, a decent vintage, but it was just decent. But I can't remember, the, I think it was rain and heat both. Uh, anyway, the, the, the 86s and 87s didn't even come close to the 85s mm -hmm. or the 83s in terms of quality because of the weather. Right. Yeah. Um, vintage is incredibly important in Burgundy and in Oregon. Well, despite the challenges that you guys have faced, you guys have also experienced great successes. Yes. So, would you attribute some of those successes more to genius or more towards, you know, to pragmatism? Pragmatism mm -hmm. or genius? Yeah. <laughs> Um, how about luck? Uh, <laughs> That'll work too. Um, the, the first thing is that it is true that Oregon, the Willamette Valley and some of the Umpqua Valley is one of the few places in the world that you can make incredible Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is not, um, is, is very sensitive to where it's grown. Mm -hmm. um, Cabernet is so strong and aggressive that it sort of overrules a lot of things. So, you know, um, and the climate, forget about the soils yet, the climate is the key thing for growing Pinot Noir, the climate. Talk about soils, fine. The soils in Oregon are completely different from the soils in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. We don't have any limestone around here, okay, yet all those Burgundian experts couldn't tell an Oregon Pinot growing on volcanic clay soil to a Burgundy growing on, on limestone. Does the soil make a huge difference? Yes. Sedimentary soils and volcanic soils produce different wines. Mm -hmm. But so Oregon had the climate. We, as I said, were focusing and focusing on improving our, our winemaking and our viticulture. And it was the viticulture that was the real um, uh, really the important thing. I mean, mm -hmm. there's some important things in winemaking, but there's a few. But viticulture was transforming. Uh, so the fact that we had a quality product for a grape that is in high demand and very small supply, Burgundy, contributed to that. That's, and I think the, we as an industry did the right things in terms of, of focusing on quality and then focusing on marketing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's 
What did it? I think I I I, I mean I I ha I have to say that um, that thing that Steve and I did was instrumental, and then right at the same time was when Robert Parker started, and Robert Parker was visiting when I was not around, and I had told my staff that there was no way in hell any wine writer was going to taste my wine in tanks. So of course, the minute Robert Parker showed up at my winery, my staff invited them in, and <laughs> took them around <laughs> and poured wine out of it. And the result was that my 1983 Winemakers Reserve was the best Oregon Pinot. He, Parker said, this is the, the, the best Pinot Noir I've ever out, had outside of Burgundy. It was me, it wasn't Irie, it wasn't Ponzi, you know, it was my little moment in the sun. Um, but uh, Parker and our work with the the tastings both just built a fire and as I say we almost washed out um, it took until I, I think 94 is when uh, when the spectator finally forgave us and Parker may have too well You've had a couple of successes and you've definitely contributed to the wine industry. Was that a conscious act, being this pioneer, one of the pioneers of Oregon wine, or was it just what you had to do in order to maintain business and in order to continue to create quality wine? Well, um, I mean, I was just a, uh, winemaker trying to to make wine and and, and sell um, I uh, you know uh, just like the industry in general my 83 and 85s were fantastic wines and I didn't get a, a score from either the spectator or, I don't ever think I ever got a score that high from Parker ever again that was back when 90 meant something. You know, nowadays, 90 is the big, 90, 93, 95. Talk about inflation. <laughs> Just, it's obscene. Um, but I, um, the, <clears throat> the weakness, my major weakness was that I was passionate um, I had some great ideas. I was not extremely well focused and I didn't keep an eye on the bottom line or how to achieve the bottom line uh, as well as I should have. Um, and uh, so after my pinnacle up here with the 83s and 85s, I sort of, I lost my place in the elite, the top 10 Oregon wineries. Um, and I don't think I ever regained it because uh, the new folks came on and, you know, the Bergstroms and the uh, Lemelsons and you know, the, uh, just uh, Christum and uh, um, Penner Ash and, you know, we can go on and on. Uh, and the industry didn't regard me as a top tier Pinot Noir winemaker. Um, after the 80s. Um, the uh, quality of my wine, of my Pinots was too up and down, too inconsistent. 
And uh, once I lost the cachet, I mean, l let me tell you how stupid I was. So Parker gives me, this is the best wine outside of Burgundy. My phone's ringing off the hook with people that want to buy it. And what I do, I say, I'm not going to let any goddamn wine writer tell me when to release my wines. So I didn't release it at that time. I mean, I could have charged $75 a, you know, $50 a bottle. I mean, I've never charged more than 50 bucks a bottle in my whole life. And all these new guys are charging 50, 60, 70. It's obscene. They have no history. They have no record. They just put their price up there so that they're considered something. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's obscene. Um, but, you know, I did stupid things like that, you know. Um, and I, uh, once, once you lose that top tier, it's really rough out there in the market. Um, and, you know, I mean, nowadays, it's rough out in the market for, for, for everybody. But uh, so I sort of turned to making inexpensive Pinot Noir to, that people wanted to buy because of the price. We mm -hmm. had an Oregon Pinot, a Willamette, and then our winemakers reserve tiers until Gosh, Diana, when did I stop making Oregon Pinot uh, and only Willamette in the 90s sometime? But don't forget your estate. What? Your estate. You did an estate Pinot. Yeah, we, we, we made a little bit of estate Pinot. But anyway, I, I started buying cheap grapes and, you know, I went off on that road because, you know, I couldn't sell... Uh, Pinot Noir in the price range <clears throat> uh, in the market out there. I could sell it out of my tasting room, but not much. And uh, I mean, David, um, David Lett set the tone for the successful marketing, which California has done the same thing, which is be exclusive, be hard to get, mm -hmm. shit on people. I mean, just, you know, be contemptuous of your customers and of the people and, and just, you know, the more you beat them, the more they want to be beat. And the, the Customers just, the, the high end, the people that want to buy the exclusive, the thing, they just flock to you because oh, I've got an Irie Pinot that nobody else, you know. And so the, the, that theme has sort of just gone on, you know. Um, uh, Ken Wright took over the leadership in that with his, you know, his futures, you know. Uh, I, I had so many people that were got caught up in buying Ken Wright Futures. And I said, have you tried this stuff? I mean, have you tasted it? Do you like it? Is that a style of Pinot you want? Oh, well, no, it's just, you know, everybody's writing it up. It's wonderful. I said, yeah. so you bought a whole bunch on barrel tasting, which you know nothing about. You spent thousands of dollars buying this wine. Are you happy? No. <laughs> but... You see, if I had, instead of trying to produce a whole bunch of inexpensive Pinot, if I had focused on making small amounts of excellent Pinot and become, instead of having a tasting room that was open all the time, you know, be by appointment and, you know, be hard to get and jack my prices up, you know, that's the su way to success in the wine industry. I'm, I'm sorry, it, you know, um, it is. And 
uh, it, it was in that time period anyway. And I didn't do that. I didn't have any financial backers and my whole last, uh, I was always trying to just stay alive, you know. Um, I'm, uh, I made very good white wines. All my colleagues in the industry thought I was one of the best white wine makers. Uh, they very seldom said anything about my Pinot. Um, and the other thing was that I let my personal taste interfere with my marketing. I'm a very good marketer, but I hate New Oak, mm -hmm. you know. It's, 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 it, I called it the ketchup of the wine industry. It was everywhere, but you guys, the consumers, loved it, you know. Mm -hmm. And people would sit there and say, oh man, this is such good Pinot Noir. It tastes so much like Pinot Noir. I said, can you smell Pinot Noir in that wine through the oak? Can you, you know, the taste and so forth. So I, I decided to make wine without any new oak in 1988. <laughs> and so, you know, as Ponzi said, Redford, you're the stubborn bastard. <laughs> And, um, you know, it was fine for my ego, it was fine for my sense of my own integrity, and it was just a stupid thing to do from a financial point of view. And so I got sort of pushed into the low-priced wine thing you know, I, I was the Riesling king for a long time, and then I became the Gewurztraminer king, and then I became the Pinot Blanc king, um, you know, but the margins on those wines weren't very good. And uh, uh, so, uh, so it became, uh, it became a struggle. I mean, it was always a struggle. And that's why, why I was so happy I sold the winery because the financial downturn in 2008, um, I was not here uh, at a critical time and I had my winemaker and my bookkeeper managing the business and, you know, our sales, my sales dropped by $300,000. Um, we got no orders from the East Coast for six months. No income. Well, there was no income, but they kept buying barrels and everything just like it was a normal year. Mm -hmm. And by the time I came back and, and realized that we were in a hell of a financial hole and I came that close to going bankrupt. And so the, from 2009 until I sold my winery in 14, there was, is all I was doing was uh, talking to people and telling them that I couldn't pay them that it would take a time, but I would, and all I was doing was just going out and selling. I was cutting deals anywhere to generate cash flow. And um, so I was glad to get out of the wine business because in 2007, I turned winemaking over completely to my wine assistant winemaker, and unlike her, uh, predecessor, uh, she just took the bit in her hands and she made some good, good pinots and so forth, but I was no longer involved in the winemaking, which I kind of liked. And then with the financial thing, I was, I was on the road six months a year, you know, selling. Now, uh, fortunately I found a buyer and I got out and I paid everybody Nobody, there's, there's so many people in this industry that uh, it's a sort of a dark side of it that, you know, you, you uh, uh, 
you think somebody is an up and standing person and then you happen to be having a drink with one of their growers and find out the grower hasn't been paid in three years. And uh, I remember when Goldschmidt took a bunch of Oregonians to Burgundy. That was a real mistake that I didn't go on that trip. Um, but I remember, uh, well, I'm not going to name names, but one grower who also was a winery saying, so-and-so is over there in Burgundy enjoying themselves and they haven't paid us in three years and if they had paid us we could be in Burgundy and they were of the quality. So I mean one of the dirty, uh, that's, the other dirty secret is, is that there's a huge number of wineries out there that are, that are not making any money, you know. They are either just barely getting by or they have uh, outside wealth. And the whole industry, when it became, uh, well, Napa Valley is, the prices for land and stuff are just, you know, I mean, you can have a hundred million dollars and you can't, you can't play in the Napa Valley game anymore. And Sonoma's like that. So people that wanted to be in the wine scene, they wanted to be part of the wine culture. They wanted to be here. Like I asked a friend of mine, I like him a lot. I said, well, wh why are you in the wine business? Well, he said, oh, well, I had some apartments back east and my accountant said they'd been depreciated out and we needed to find something else. And I heard that it was uh, pretty good to out in Oregon. And so I came out here. He's since become fairly active in his winery. But the, just go around and visit all the new wineries. I mean, in, there's, there's so many of them that it's people that, that they hire their staff, everything is hired, and they just want to sort of be there and be the thing. And that's sad, but that's part of the growth of the industry. But the, the, other, the other part of the industry that's so exciting is all the kids that are the cellar masters, uh, cellar rats and so forth that are that have the kind of passion that Ponzi and Lett and I did. You know, they're they're in it for passion and they're starting by making wine at somebody's winery of a couple hundred cases, you know, and they're you know uh, if they're married the, the spouse has got a job to support the other person's habit and uh, uh, yeah. Don't get me started on the wives in the wine industry. You should do a, you should do a, a, a thing and look at the divorce rate in uh, the Oregon wine industry. I think uh, Ponzi. Yeah, Ponzi is the only one that uh, that survived. And the Campbells. Campbells. Thank you. Yeah. Because David and Diana Lett separated, they didn't get divorced, but Erath went down, and uh, it's just—it's a very hard business. And so, yeah, especially anyway. on marriages. What? Especially on marriages. Yes, yeah. yeah. But a lot of the mistakes that you were talking about—I mean, you've donated a lot of your collection to our archive. Yes. And people who come and use your you know, use the documents that you saved, that's just experience to them. So they're learning from what, you know, from your history and your evolution. Mm -hmm. So it isn't a waste. Oh, no, I know. No, uh, have I ever said it's a waste? You know, <laughs> uh, my beloved wife, uh, you know, um, some people used to say when she first came around that she was after me for my money and then what it what it has been is that she had the jobs and with the winery i couldn't travel unless it was on business i didn't have any 
personal money. Mm -hmm. You know, it was all in the business. So if I wanted to have fun, I would set up business things and then tack on, you know, a trip to Florida, you know, that kind of thing. But Vicky was w working well. The problem was is that she, uh, uh, <laughs> here she was, she was a, a nurse, she was head of the McMinnville uh, intensive care thing and making good money and everything. And so we start living together and after a little while she says, I'm quitting my job. <laughs> what? You can't. <laughs> Well, where's all our fun money going to come from? You know. <laughs> so she went back to and got her master's degree, and then she finished her master's and she got uh, hired. She was a quality con quality assurance person at the McMinnville Hospital, and so she was working part time while she was getting her master's degree, helping nursing homes um, that were in danger of losing their licenses because they weren't meeting state specifications. And she worked for this one company whose philosophy was to come into the nursing home, bring in all their people, bring everything up to standard, pull their people out. Two years later, the nursing home is, is uh, on the verge of getting their license yet. And Vicki's philosophy, she and a friend, was you go in, you, you see what the problem is, you train the people that are there, show them the proper way. Anyway, she was making incredible, I mean, we, we used to sit around and she said, I, I got so damn many offers, I don't know what to do. I said, increase your price increase your price so we would be naive and not knowing the business world would increase our rates to $75 an hour or something that is all that did is in it's like pouring gasoline on oh she's she's good and she's higher price so it must be better so she was doing really well and <laughs> she came home one day and said I just can't take it anymore you know the pressure's so great nope Come on, just, just, just hold on for another year. We could have a lot. <laughs> so she went back to school and got a PhD and became a teacher and so forth. But, but um, yeah, the, the winery wives, I look at some of these young couples and, and you, you say, I say to them, oh, so you're, uh, you're going to support your husband in this. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually the w wife. Occasionally, mm -hmm. it's the husband. But anyway, you know, I think I found a document that actually mentioned Vicky. It was um, how Gamay lost its Beaujolais and got its Noir. Uh -huh. Do you remember that? I uh, think it was a fun little um, story how... that your your staff wrote up. I think in '96 is the date. Uh. Does that sound familiar to you? I when you say that, I, it rings a bell. But I. Yeah, did she write that? I'm not too sure if Vicky wrote it, but um, well, I don't. I actually don't think so because um, it mentions the way that you and Vicky met was you were praying to the uh, wine gods, and Vicky came down and said, ah, "You can, you know, you can change the uh, name to Noir. You can't use Beaujolais." And then you asked her after the mist clears, "Do you want to go grab a drink?" And she said yes. <laughs> Boy, I don't remember that. I, you're going to have to dig that out. I'm going to have to find what fictional writer wrote that one. Yeah, yeah it's one of my favorites in the collection, so I'll definitely sure. make a copy for you. Yeah, would you? Just yeah. e e e you have it electronic. Can you email I it? I do, to yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's uh, do, you, do you remember that, Diana? I didn't hear all that she said, but uh, uh, you can yeah. revise me. Yeah, so... <laughs> How does it feel like to have, you know, your collection in the archives and, you know, having basically your career out for people to, you know, look at? Well, you know, one thing, it feels really good because I'm a pack rat, right? And that's why that thing is, and, and it, it's, it's, 
it's helped you guys because I, one, I think one of the major contributions I made to this industry is that I was always for inclusion and not exclusion. And I always tried to include people, give people credit, and, 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 and you see it in my collection, is that I kept stuff about all sorts of other people. Um, and uh, so that's, that's why you have that collection, is because number one, I was a pack rat, uh, and number two, I, I like to get information on, on all of the other people and you know, what was going on in the industry. Um, you know, Diana was taking care of Amity. She was, you know, I wasn't doing a very good job on, <laughs> on keeping a, a collection of things at Amity, but Diana was doing that. And I just, you know, I, as you can see from the papers, I was involved. Um, I was never, usually never the uh, top person. Uh, but I was involved, you know. I I, uh, I was a, 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 one of the winemakers that Barney Watson used to evaluate his small lot wines and everything over the years. Um, that's uh, that was a great thing. You should interview Barney Watson, by the way. Um, he is the person more than anybody else responsible for a lot of the quality increases in the winemaking in Oregon. And um, I mean, he made the small lots of the uh, wines that determine which, and we determine which clones have, were going to be released. Like on Gamay, there were five clones. Mm -hmm. We only released two of them. And, um, and, so forth. So, anyway, yeah. Um, does that answer your question, or it did does. I wander off again? No, that's fine. Yeah. And I mean, your collection, as you said, is going to be useful for, to yeah. a lot of people who yeah, want to know more. Yeah, it's going to be, more. and uh, that I I feel really, really good about it. And I, um, you know, I, I guess. I mean, you guys see it. I mean, I go down to my cellar and I find, oh, humbug. Oh, these guys need to know about humbug, you know? Mm -hmm. um, these are wineries that, uh, um, I wasn't in the mainstream of the wine industry, you know? I was sort of, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't part of the uh, elite group and, and um, I, had more contact with some sort of the edges and people and I like to go visit new wineries and do things and so forth so well you were the invisible kind of you know push behind the industry you're the invisible one you know? <laughs> yeah the, and I'm, I'm I mean the, all movements need that though yeah you know well I I uh, I think I contributed a lot to the Oregon wine industry and I want to make absolutely sure that after that period of telling you about all the trials and tribulations of uh, woulda, shoulda, coulda, is that, um, you know, I've had a really good and fun, fun life um, in the wine industry. And as I say, my only sort of sadness is that it, that it ended with me being burned out, um, but you know, other than the last five years, I, it, it was uh, it was an interesting time. Most of my friends are people that I have met in the uh, customers and people like that. I'm Rachel Woody here with Myron Redford for part two on May 16th here at Nicholson Library. And Myron, we want to follow up on one of the areas that you spoke about, um, talking about some of the, the early people involved in the industry and the relationships and working together. I'm wondering what 
some of the interpersonal dynamics were like when you guys were in the firehouse meeting, for example. Who was passionate about what? Um, how did those things work out? What were the meetings like? Oh boy. Uh, who was passionate about what? Well, um, <clears throat> the, the meetings themselves were technical. Um, we would have a business meeting or so forth. I, I don't know whether I, did I have any notes from, from any of those meetings there? Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, and so the, when, when Corey was here until he left, he, he would attend quite a few and as I say, also taught classes and he would make a, uh, some contributions. Um, the, uh, as far as, uh, as, as passions, um, I, I don't want to be unfair to David Lett, but my memory is that he wasn't very involved. He, he rarely came to those meetings. Um, Ponzi, Erath, um, Ron Volstek from Oak Knoll, um, the Bill Blosser. Um, in the early years, it was all Bill. It was Susan became uh, interested later. Um, Campbell's came sometimes. And then there was a lot of growers. Um, uh, because a lot of what we were focusing on was viticulture. And uh, then there was the, <laughs> let's say the hard drinking crowd. Uh, as I said, we didn't have uh, anything but California jug wine uh, for the first 10 years because none of us had any money and so we couldn't go out, you know, for 10, 20, 30 people, you know, it's a lot of money if you're gonna buy. So we'd just get, and uh, so there'd be a little tasting and so forth. And then most people would go home to their families and so forth. And then a group of us would go across the street to Gaffer's Pub and, and uh, uh, Corey and I and Erath and uh, until he left, Jerry Preston even came to a few. Um, Was the general sense that everybody got along? And I mean, you guys pushed through so much, whether it was legislation or viticulture research. Um, were all of you pretty united in what you wanted to achieve? Well, as you r remember from the previous interview, um, originally there was this split between the Roseburg mm -hmm. group and the North, and I can't uh, remember how many years it was before we finally put the, uh, the two organizations together, but um, the meetings in Tigard continue. I can't even remember when they when they stopped, or did we just stop having meetings? I believe in the late seventies, the Tigard group it came together with the South, and they sort of reunited. Uh huh. Um, so I think at that point they had stopped. 
Um, no, it was because you know, you said, well, it may have been, it may have been the early 80s, late 70s. Mm -hmm. I don't, mm -hmm. that's probably what it was, is that they started having statewide meetings mm -hmm. and those sort of involved into Grape Day. Right. Um, and we started doing things with uh, the folks at OSU. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's what it sort of evolved into. And uh, yeah. So people tend to point to the collaboration and the camaraderie of the early days yes. as to why the Oregon wine industry has been so successful. Yes, it's true. And do you think that today that is still the case or has it evolved beyond that? Well, um, when I was last active in the industry, when, uh, it seemed to still be the case. Um, there's the culture of, in the beginning was we all hang together, we all hang separately. And we were very close, so like Ponzi and I, we lived 40 miles apart and we shared equipment, you know, because he was raising a family and so forth. So we used to share things and but the, um, like at the viticulture committee that I talked about, you know, everybody's in there and, and, and helping. And uh, at the meetings, you know, the, we had, I mean, you know, you know, when you have a large group of people, you always have some splits, but the, the dominant thing with the exception of that friction between north and south was um, helping each other and, and doing things together. I mean, getting the uh, Oregon labeling regulations through 78, I believe, was when we did it. That that's, was a, uh, I, I can remember some pretty, um, contentious meetings over some of that. Um, like Paul B. Elland flat out refused to give up the term Johannesburg Riesling on his Riesling. So we just grandfathered him in, but said if the winery changed hands or if he retired the label, it couldn't be used anymore. And at that time, we were using the term white Riesling and why we just didn't do Riesling, which we eventually did. Um, uh, <laughs> tell you a funny story. So we have, we've made a law now that you can't use any European place name, so you can't have Johannesburg Riesling anymore. And the, I think the official name of the grape is white Riesling. So, we did that and for uh, a long time people would put white Riesling. I think some of my earlier labels said white Riesling. Well then Chateau Saint-Michel <laughs> came up with this thing where they had a Johannesburg Riesling which was sort of off dry and then they had a white Riesling which was really sweet. <laughs> Um, I hope I'm remembering c correctly, but it was, it, it was, it just made, <laughs> you know, people come down from Washington, oh, you have white Riesling, I don't want it, it's too sweet, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, so Paul was a holdout on that one. Um, uh, I think most, and that, I gave credit to David Adelsheim earlier, he was quite good at working out compromises. Bill Nelson, who was um, enologist for Richard Summers back in the early years, and then became 
the head of the Oregon Wine Growers Association and was our lobbyist uh, was was involved also a lot. Um, he and at the moment I have a a sense that there were some other areas of dispute. I think Champagne we agreed to leave that off. We didn't finally get rid of the term champagne until 10 years ago or something. Uh, and I was talking to Jason Lett and I said, your, uh, your dad wanted the definition of an estate to be adjacent to or within 30 miles of because that's where his vineyard was from your winery and Jason says that's hogwash um, he says and the mileage isn't isn't correct or something my memory is there was a big there was a big uh, controversy over that because Lett wanted to be able to say his wines were a state bottle. And so the definition of a state um, had to be fixed. And I don't know how far it is from his winery to his vineyard, but if you go back and look at the early law, there was a, the distance that you could be if the grapes were under contract was several miles away. Uh, that was, you know, just trying to accommodate people. Um, I don't remember Erath or anybody. I don't remember any other. I remember that one. I remember the Johannesburg Riesling and so forth. But other, other than, uh, than that, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that we, we did it, we were the only labeling regulations in the whole United States and the whole industry had to vote and the OLCC that's right the Oregon Liquor Control Commission in their vast wisdom decreed that every licensed winery not vineyard but winery in the state had to vote yes on the regulations or they would not be enacted and that's why Paul B. Ellen was able to hold out for his thing. And I don't remember any other grandfathering that went on. Um, yeah. Looking at the size of the industry today, mm -hmm. do you think that Oregon can still be considered a small wine industry? By world standards, yes. We're small. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Virginia's catching up with us, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> now that Trump is the presidential candidate and has a winery there, apparently Virginia wines are becoming very popular. Uh, no, we're, we're, we're small. I mean, I think, I don't think we, You'd have to check the statistics, but I don't think we have as much acreage as Burgundy does mm -hmm. under cultivation yet. But I may be wrong in the state, but in the Willamette Valley. Um, and one of the interesting developments, I, w we had continuing fights um, with the Southern Oregon group and uh, over when I was on the wine advisory board on like we tried to do a promotion for Pinot Noir and salmon duh isn't I, you know 60% of the production was Pinot Noir at the time and everything and the guys from the south said no uh, we're not going to back a promotion that's only for Pinot Noir we don't do Pinot Noir I said Ted Gerber does Pinot Noir down there and they killed it uh, 
Uh, so uh, my response to them always was, look, we do this program for the Willamette Valley, you come up with a program for Southern Oregon, and we'll do it for Southern Oregon. You guys get your act together and get that. So I've been really excited to see that, um, that they got together and they created the Southern Oregon Appalachian and they're becoming more um, of, of a dynamic uh, group and, and, and supporting. Because that's the only continually not all to all for one and one for all has been the split between uh, the, the south and now there's a little bit up in the gorge people who are not part of the Willamette Valley and feel left out um, so I've been excited about that I hope I answered your question you did okay in your time in the industry how have you seen it evolve and where do you think it's going in the time in the industry, how have I seen it evolve? Well, um, it, 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 it has evolved from a cottage industry to an actual industry. It's evolved from a majority of owner operators to a majority of uh, owners with hired staff, owners who don't, aren't doing everything. Uh, and we always uh, worried about the napification of Oregon. And uh, uh, it's, uh, As, as I said to Camille before, um, the exciting thing in the industry for me is the kids who haven't got anything but have the passion like the original founders did. I think that's where the passion of the industry and the, uh, I'm not, I, I don't know most of the, uh, most of the new owners. Uh, so I'm not saying they're good or bad people or, or anything. I'm just saying that that most of them, the, most of the new owners are uh, people that had wealth already and came in and wanted to be part of the industry. You know, there's a guy over there that has an art gallery in his, his winery. Um, you know, sort of like the one down in the Napa Valley. Uh, it's this kind of things. Uh, so the, the kids give me hope and the, 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 the community gives me hope and the pressure of economics gives me pause because the pressure of economics is driving people from high cost areas to lower cost areas and we're, we're becoming a high cost area. Um, so that's gonna change it. Um, Kendall Jackson has come in and bought a lot of land and has jumped in and been quite active. Um, uh, Jadot was the second French uh, company to come in and buy land and establish a winery. I think that's positive. Um, let's see, who else? Who's the other big? Oh, there's uh, uh, there's there's some real big players now that are starting to consider Oregon, but that's the sign of a, a mature industry. I mean, Chateau Saint-Michel owns Erath and they've just bought several hundred acres next to my old, next to Amity Vineyards, just a little ways down. So, 
I guess I'm not pessimistic about the future. Um, I think it's going to change, and I hope that I hope there's the small people are able to continue to percolate and and survive. Um, I give you an ex interesting example. I was the first one to plant gamay in in Oregon, and I promoted the hell out of it, trying to get people. I said, Gamay can be cropped in warm sites. We can have an inexpensive Oregon red wine. Come on, guys, let's plant it. Let's make it. Um, Will Kenzie and Brickhouse made sort of like a premier crew priced and limited availability. And I'm, I, I cranked up pretty high. But nobody else was interested. And now I have an acre and a quarter of Gamay, and I have like five people in a, standing in a line asking to buy grapes. And everybody's talking Gamay, Gamay. So, so maybe, maybe we were just ahead of our time. Um, so I'm not, yeah. In your opinion, what makes good wine? In my opinion, what makes good wine? The wine is a beverage. It's made from a fruit. Uh, and its purpose is pleasure. It's not appreciating in value. It's not that everybody wants to buy this bottle because somebody said it's wonderful. It's something that gives the person who buys it pleasure and enjoyment. And the wider the range of acceptable pleasures, the better. I, as I mentioned earlier, I hate wine snobs. I just, they just drive me nuts because a lot of the time they're so insecure that what they do is belittle the beginning wine drinkers and make them feel insecure and everything. And we've got this thing that I don't know how many times, every time I turn around to somebody who's not in the wine industry and say, would you like some wine? How do you like this wine? Oh, I'm not a wine expert. I don't care if you're a wine expert. Do you like the wine or don't you like the wine? And I would just like people to be able to, to, to stop saying that people who like white Zinfandel are bad people. They like white Zinfandel because it tastes good to them. And is it a well-made white Zinfandel? Great. I think that that is, is what it's, it's all about. Honest winemaking. Um, now, if you go into the technical things, well-made wine, that's a whole different thing. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a snob about technically correct wines, you know. Uh, but, and I think that I think that that's sort of where I would draw the line is when people say that this is a good wine and it's just full of winemaking faults. Mm. Um, so, uh, but other than that, just, just allow people to enjoy wine and appreciate wine. And the, the people who are just starting to taste and 
most of us started out on sweet wine and got over to dry whites and then reds and so forth. And then once you become a wine connoisseur or a experienced wine drinker, you, you, you love all wine. And you look at the wine and say, when's the best time to drink this? What, what to drink it with? And a wine for, for, for different occasions. I, you know, when my brother wants to drink Cabernet with crab, I, I cringe. I mean, to me, that is an abomination because the Cabernet is so strong, it just wipes out the crab. Uh, so you're, I mean, you might as well buy canned crab as good fresh crab. But we used to buy crab. We would open a bottle of off-dry Riesling, which is the Oregon Riesling, which is the best marriage in heaven with fresh crab. We would finish the bottle. And Steve would go, Mr. Winemaker, can I now have some Cabernet? <laughs> so, you know, it's it's include what I got back to you know inclusive versus you know uh, uh, non-inclusive. You know, if you oh you're a Riesling drinker, oh you're 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 no, we're all wine drinkers and we drink different things and um, so. Uh, what is a great wine? You asked me what a good wine was, right? Well, great wines are a different thing, okay? And great wines are always rare, okay? And in some cases, you have to have some experience with that type of wine to appreciate that it's a great wine. That doesn't mean that the person who likes to drink white Zinfandel is a, uh, is a bad person, but it just means if I pour them a great Pinot Noir or a ordinary Pinot Noir, they probably won't be able to distinguish the difference. Um, but great wines are rare, and they're the convergence of an ideal vintage with good winemaking. And great wines, by my definition, are wines that will last for years. Okay. I would never say, for example, that if I made the best Beaujolais Nouveau or Gamay Nouveau or something, you know, and it was just what I considered the arch perfect Nouveau, that it's a great wine. It's a very good wine of its species, but it's not a great wine. And uh, yeah, so there's the distinction between good wine and great wine and the that's where the wine snobs come in because wine snobs drink the label and not the wine so for them if it isn't a uh, highly regarded label it can't be a great wine whereas i have tried many of the great labels that have not produced in some vintages, they haven't lived up to expectations. And yet on other times, I've tried wines and they've been just spectacular. What is your winemaking philosophy? What is my winemaking philosophy? I'm not a winemaker anymore. I don't have any philosophy. <laughs> Did you at any point? <laughs> I'm an agnostic. <laughs> Um, well, 
You know, these days, the, the wine making is like everything else. Um, it's trendy and uh, there's the in thing and the out thing uh, example from a winemaking point of view. Whole cluster pressing of white grapes. It's now de rigueur. You don't use whole cluster pressing? Whoa, whoa. To me, it's style, you know. Um, and now, Nobody's given, nobody, I haven't seen any article anywhere talking about Myron Redford beating on too much oak back in 1988. But now there was an article where they interviewed, I don't know if it was Ken Wright or Bergstrom, and they were writing this article about how he had discovered the benefits of less oak. And I'm going, ah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're taking, you're taking the two of the oakiest winemakers in the state and giving them credit for dropping from 100% to 75%, and this is a revolutionary new thing. Why don't you give Myron a little credit for saying that, that you know, that there was way too much oak and so forth. Um, Oh, how did I get off on that tangent? What was the question? Uh, Winemaking philosophy. Oh, okay. So, um, uh, I, I think my winemaking philosophy comes back to what I said, what makes a good wine. Wine is a pleasurable beverage. And to me, if the wine is not in balance, you know, take sweet wines, there's all sorts of sweet wines. But if you have a sweet wine that isn't balanced with some acidity, 95% of the sweet wine drinkers will be able to tell you that they don't, that that doesn't satisfy as much as one that's balanced. Um, it, there, there are ideological winemakers who get, you know, uh, biodynamics or, or natural philosophy. I had a friend, I really liked him up in the Okanagan Valley, and he wanted to make natural wine. And what was natural wine? You picked your grapes, you let them ferment, and whatever happened was what happened. He made some of the most god-awful wines I've ever had in my life. Because very rarely does Mother Nature give you the perfect balance. And so you have to, you have to do something. If, if Mother Nature is giving you one and a half percent acid and 10 percent alcohol. The only thing that's good for is cleaning the enamel on your teeth. But he was making wines out of it because that was the natural sugar and that was the acidity and I'm not going to mess with the sugar or the acidity. So there's that. And there's not a lot of ideological more of the problem is the, the trendiness, you know, like women's skirts have gone, go up and then they go back down and then they go up, you know, it just depends what, whether you're in the 20s or the 40s or the, or the what. And in winemaking, you know, oak goes up and oak goes down and uh, uh, big, huge, very ripe wines become the, de rigueur and then suddenly the sommeliers and everybody gets tired which is easy to do if you're drinking 15 percent wine all the time and now now some people won't buy a wine if it has a high alcohol on the label um, i love wine and I love well-made wine, and 
my philosophy is that you try and make the best, most in, enjoyable, pleasurable product from what you are given by Mother Nature and what it is in your ability to modify it as, as necessary. Um, and I think any philosophy that puts ideology into the picture um, doesn't make uh, is is doesn't make good wine. Doesn't make good politics either. You know, it's sort of like people who say compromise is a dirty word. You know, it's sort of like saying what I just said that. Uh, you, you have to stick to your ideals and you have to produce a, a, a wine. You can't compromise with Mother Nature. She's done it. Well, in politics, but it, same thing in winemaking. If you, if you don't do an adjustment here, an adjustment there, and maybe, you know, so, yeah, that, I'd say that's my philosophy. I drink a lot of wine and I like to, I like to enjoy it, and it's 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 sad that finding a good white wine is a hundred times easier than finding a good red wine. You know, uh, I guess that's why my colleagues like like me because I made you know. Uh, very good white wines because I because it adhered to my philosophy and it was not against their philosophy that I'm taking a fruit and I'm making it to show the fruit in balance when you get into red wines then you know they people sort of forget that a red wine is a grape that's made into a liquid from a fruit and in my humble opinion one of the major things you want to do is to showcase the fruit. And so that's where my philosophy diverged from the industry when the, the idea of putting a whole bunch of oak in, uh, to me, and, I, and I, I took an extreme position that no oak is, I mean, no new oak is an extreme position. But I can tell you from tasting wine after wine, particularly, I don't like to drink wine, red wine, younger than about five years if I can, particularly Pinot, because I think it needs time to evolve in the bottle. And that's when you start to see what I call the cutoff. You open this wine, and if they've, if they've, if they know what they're doing with oak, which is a whole different question because a lot of people don't know what the hell they're doing with it and therefore they're sort of like them. Uh, but if they know what they're doing, they'll get a, 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 an oak that produces sweetness in the wine and has nice aromatics. What a lot of oak does is even if it produces pleasant aromatics, you get into the wine and this wine comes into your mouth and you're in love. You know, it is just sweet and fruitful and everything and then it goes back and you're all of a sudden this wall drops and it just, you hit the dry, you know, it just dries out and instead of having a sweet, long lasting finish, you have this, well, maybe a, appropriate on a young Cabernet or even a young Pinot that's for long aging, but on a five-year-old wine, if you're already starting to get, then, you know, it's just, it just, it just cuts it off. And for a long time, I made overly tannic wines. And I did it because I wasn't using new oak. And so I, I tried to put more tannin in it to give it more structure so that it would age longer. 
and uh, uh, then in my later years, I I sort of went back to the, you know, Pinot Noir is about velvety, velvet silkiness going down your throat, and go out and taste a whole bunch of Pinot Noirs, go tasting Pinot Noirs and ask yourself, how many of those are wonderful up front and then when they start going down, instead of lovely silkiness, you get drying tannins, the fruit just stops. Now if they have balanced the oak and they've used sweet oak, you'll have a sweet finish. But um, there's yeah, I made my point. Shifting gears a bit to deciding to sell Amity and retiring, what was that transition like, selling the vineyard? Um, what have you been doing in retirement? Okay, uh, as I explained to Camille, the last five years uh, from 2009 to 14 were just hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, <laughs> It was just get up, figure some way to, and go on sales trips and sell, uh, and apologize to people that you're behind and so forth. It's amazing the number of people that get in debt and don't realize that the most important thing when you're in debt is communication with your creditor. I mean, I didn't ha I only had one person file an action against me, and that was because they were a corporation and the, their policy was that if they hadn't been paid in so many months, they just filed an action. And I said, well, if you file an action against me, you'll have to collect because I won't pay you if you file an action against me because I'm giving you my word that I'm going to pay and I'll pay everybody. Turned out they had an insurance policy, so they didn't care. <laughs> um, now I've gone off my track. What was I? Well, oh. cut. <laughs> what? Where was I? What? What was the question? Uh, selling and retirement. Oh, what retirement. You... Sorry, yes. I no got worries. off. That. Okay. So when I when I I was trying to sell the winery for five years, it's ironic that about eight, somewhere between eight and ten years ago, somebody came to me and wanted to buy the winery. He was an agent. He wouldn't tell me who wanted to buy it or what they wanted to do, but they wanted to buy it. And I didn't want to, to sell. <laughs> Crash comes. Please, where is he? <laughs> Nobody wants to buy it. So when I sold that winery, it was like, you know, because when I sold it, the assets from the sale paid off the last of the bank loan, and suddenly there was no more phone calls, no more, I was just, <sighs> unfortunately, um, closing businesses don't end when you sell them. <laughs> mm -hmm. I still have distributors that owe me money, because I didn't, they didn't buy my receivables. Uh, and I've had two years of emails from various governmental agencies all over saying, you still owe taxes for shipping wine to New York and stuff, you know. And so it, it's taken about two years to, to, to wind all, all this stuff up. We, dissolved the corporation. See, when we sold Amity Vineyards, we had to change the name of the corporation. We changed it to MJV, Myron, Janice, and Vicky, the three of us that own it, and created this corporation. And we dissolved that last Monday, and we're now in the process of uh, um, being done, which will, uh, after the taxes are filed, about in July and it will just be such a relief um, people ask me how are you enjoying retirement I said well 
I don't really feel retired when when I'm spending my time, uh, you know, like right now I'm in a dispute with the Oregon Liquor Control Commission over an audit from 2014. They say I owe the money, I say I don't. So I'm still, uh, but when that goes away, hopefully it'll be done and I am so glad to be finished with it. Um, I wish it had ended, you know, differently, um, but that's the way it ended and I am now uh, this close to being retired to farming. Mm. And then I'm going to be just like the, the, the farmer in New Jersey that won the lottery and won a million dollars. And they said to him, well, what are you going to do now that you have a million dollars? He says, just keep on farming till it's all gone. <laughs> 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 so we have our 15 acre uh, organic farm with grapes, uh, plums, pears, olives, peaches, and I enjoy the hell out of it. Spent yesterday planting our garden, and what I want to do is I want to I want to get up one morning and not have anything connected to having to do something for somebody else other than my farm, and I'm looking very much forward to that. I'm uh, about two months behind pruning my olives and and uh, very soon, another month or two, I'm going to have to start thinning my peaches and stuff. And I just enjoy the hell out of it. And uh, that's what I want to do. And we're traveling mm. a lot. So, but, you know, um, Vicki and I decided we'd, we've, we've done Asia. We haven't gone to every place in Asia, but we'll, we've been to a lot and we just did South Africa and other than Chile maybe I don't have any need to go off I I have friends in Turkey and I really enjoy visiting Turkey and uh, uh, with the terrorist stuff, things have gotten really cheap in Turkey. <laughs> so if you're not not worried, which I'm not, uh, and then I want to, I, I just love going to to France and Italy and Germany and so forth. So that's what I, what I want to do and maybe I'll even, uh, oh I might, who knows, I might try and do something else, but I'm I really, really, really after, let's see, it's two years now that I've sold the winery. I really want to feel retired, except for my farm. I just don't want to do anything else. I have a friend who retired and he doesn't do anything, you know, except read books and go for walks. His wife keeps trying to get him to do things and he's perfectly happy. He reads book after book after book and so forth so I I'll get back to reading I, I haven't read much um, uh, for quite a while and it'd be really nice and then the other thing this is the big retirement thing is to get is to try and retire my type A personality <laughs> and that probably won't work but you know, I am so, I've been so driven and all my life to, that I always have to be doing things, you know. And I'm such a Puritan in a way that I think, I, I almost feel guilty when I'm um, just doing nothing, you know. Mm. It's sort of a Puritan thing. Uh, I think, oh well, I've got to, get up and do the dishes or I've got to do this or I've got to do that. And I just got to be able to learn that it is okay to get up, have breakfast, 
grab a book and go sit down and just read the book until you're tired reading and get up and do something else. And that's what I'm looking forward to, to retiring. <laughs> Good. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> well, Check in in a year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, just real quick then, we'll wrap up the interview. Thank you, Myron, so much for sitting down with us and congratulations on your retirement. Thank you guys, this has been a very pleasant experience. Thank you very much.